Hey there, welcome to the Game Artist Podcast. My name is Ryan Kingsline. I am the founder of the Game Art Institute, where we train artists for the career of their lives. In this podcast, we interview amazing game artists to see what makes them tick and see how they got where they are today. So sit back, relax. I look forward to sharing their journey with you. All right. Well, welcome, Rosa. Thank you so much for taking time out of the day to join me here. Oh, hello. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I, you know, it's, you're doing us the service. I'm looking at this work and it's, un, it's just beautiful. It's just beautiful. <laughs> um, why don't we start uh, with you giving us just a sense of like what you've done in, in terms of uh, your training and, and how you got here? Uh, so my training, um, should I start from my education or? Six uh, years old. Were you an <laughs> artist? <laughs> well, I mean, I, I did uh, art entire my life. So yeah, pretty much, yeah, I've been drawing always. Um, but college, I didn't go to college for 3D art. I actually went to college for um, industrial design. Mm -hmm. um, because like everybody else, I didn't know I was going to be a game artist. Um, and after uh, the graduation, um, I found out I don't have a passion for industrial design and also didn't want to go to expensive art schools, um, couldn't afford it. So I went back to Korea for about a couple years. Mm -hmm and did like a personal training there. Yeah. They, they have a really good like um, school, not not formal school, but they have really nice programs there. Mm -hmm. um, they will teach you one-on-one -on -one and you only, uh, they only cost like $400 a month. So it was mm -hmm. like way cheaper and faster option for me. Mm -hmm. um, and I made a couple portfolio pieces there and came back to Washington. Mm -hmm. I got my first job as a 3D generalist in an indie studio. And shortly after I got hired by ArenaNet, um, worked on Guild Wars. That's one of my older work. Mm -hmm. um, and um, it was there for about a year. Um, but uh, yeah, my contract ended and I had to find something else and went to Microsoft uh, Xbox. I was there for a short amount of time, then got hired by Bungie and was there for about three to four years. Um, yeah, and here I am at 343. Awesome. Um, and so, uh, three, four, you got it. The, um, I think one of the things that's really important to kind of hit on is you went back to Korea and you created a, a couple of portfolio pieces. Mm -hmm. And and that's a lot. That's where a lot of students are right now is, is they're at that stage. So what did you find was important? And I know things have changed. Uh, the industry is always changing. But what did you think or find was important in those portfolio pieces? What did they have to have? Uh, so if you scroll down, one of the... Um the one with the the girl with the the gun and the white hair yeah that was one of the first portfolio pieces i have mm -hmm. um well it's it's not the strongest one i have obviously it was one of my first characters mm -hmm. i made korea um uh i mean well honestly i have to be honest with you like, yes. luck has played a huge role in my career uh, my work wasn't the best, um, but I was just looking for a job, the right timing. Okay. What does um, that mean, though? What made it the right timing? So, uh, let's say, for example, if I applied ArenaNet a year earlier or a year later, mm -hmm. I my career path uh, might have been very different. Because <laughs> okay. like when I went to ArenaNet and honestly my art test wasn't the greatest like even the lead told me my art test uh, was okay it wasn't amazing mm -hmm. but um at the time i uh there was less competition i was a local and he saw potential in my portfolio that's why he hired me right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but when i looked at other 
arena net artists and their art tests they were just amazing like i wouldn't even have competed with them so it's kind of like i thought i got lucky and even for bungie too like when i got hired at bungie um while i was there uh, for three to four years uh it was the only time that they hired like entry level artists mm -hmm. so uh, when i got there as an entry level artist later on they never hire entry level they only hired senior artists you know what i mean like if mm -hmm. i applied a year later i would probably wouldn't have made it to bungee um but um in terms of portfolio i even asked like hiring managers what's important mm -hmm. Um, when you look at students' portfolios. And um, one uh, impression I got was they value complete characters more. Yeah. yeah. So rather than having really nice ZBrush sculpts, it's important to show your textures yeah. and your work in progress shot and um, prove that you can finish a character from scratch to you know render. So I think it's important to have uh, a character to demonstrate your sculpting, low poly, uh, texturing, and also like lighting and rendering even. Right. Yeah, that's great. Actually, we've heard that, um, me and the students have heard that from almost everybody that comes in, finish mm -hmm. the pieces. Mm -hmm. um, so you, you say you've gotten lucky. Um, what about uh, Bungie? Mm -hmm. Was that luck? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I I mentioned that. Um, oh, I meant three four threes actually. Uh, the, three four three. Uh, yeah. I don't I don't think so. Um, actually, at, when I got to certain level, um, yeah. I had enough portfolio pieces that demonstrate my hard surface sculpting, and I made uh, enough characters so, to prove my uh, ability and skills. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's why uh, 343 contacted me to see if I'm interested uh, getting high, uh, working in 343. Mm -hmm. And I interviewed, I uh, met some nice people and I decided to move. Okay, you were recruited. Right, but it's like always the first stage, like getting your foot in the door is most important and frustrating right. and hard part of the, the yeah. process. So, uh, What did you do when you were on Guild Ward? What, what were you responsible for? So Guild Wars stuff, they actually been uh, outsourcing first batch of high poly. Mm -hmm. So when um, they get the uh, high poly sculpts back, um, artists kind of finishes off the sculpts, like polishing and reshaping a little bit, and yeah. then do retopo and do full hand paint texturing. Uh -huh. Yeah, I've had several um, students go into that job it's not oh. always what people expect because they're like, oh, I'm going to become a game artist. And then you end up finishing work. <laughs> and right. uh, it can be a bit of a letdown, but it's a great entry because it probably hones your skills on the essential stuff. Exactly. Yeah. No, I, I was thrilled to work on Guild Wars. I mean, their sculpts, I learned a lot from breaking them down piece yeah. by piece and just to go through all the pipeline and see how they are made. It really helped me uh, learning even more than in school, my first mm -hmm. month, I think. And uh, even like hand texturing, like I didn't know much about hand texturing then, but it's like I basically learned everything ground up. Okay, that's great. Now from Guild Wars, you went to uh, Microsoft. Do you have any of the work from Microsoft here or? No, it was a very early stage of Xbox Avatar. Okay, they were revamping like Xbox Avatar, and I was just um, I was helping them with really early like exploration stage. Mm. Don't have time for it. Okay, and then um, when you got to Bungie, was there was there something in the portfolio that they liked? And I and I I'm asking because I've got a lot of students that listen to this and and that are here watching it, and I'm the way that we approach things in the boot camp, and you can tell me what you think of this, um, is we aim for the hiring triggers, right? Because we assume <laughs> we assume right off the bat that it's too much to know and master. And you know, it's like anatomy is is some people's entire life they study anatomy. So mm -hmm. it, 
it's endless. Um, so we focus on the hiring triggers. So the thing that I'm thinking, and it sounds like you've asked people this before, you know, I'm, I'm always trying to figure out like, what do you, people think are the hiring triggers? Finishing so, the characters one, sorry. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, no, go ahead. No, that was it. Um, so when I got, I was interviewing uh, with Bungie, like, I didn't have any hard surface or sci-fi themed right. portfolio pieces, right? Yeah. Um, but I, I think they mainly looked at um, hard armor pieces because because mm. uh, uh, if you look at some of the um, the Guild Wars stuff, they still have some like hard hard surface armor. I think there's a one with the the girl with uh, really heavy armor on. Um, this one. The, it, it, this one is mainly like a cloth. And yeah. <laughs> probably not a good one um the one above that one uh, hold on oh there we go yeah. yeah yeah that one so like if you have if you can demonstrate that you can uh, uh, sculpt or make hard surface some kind of hard surface mm -hmm. armor. but honestly i think my art test with bungee was the main trigger pretty much okay. i mean this was enough to get me the art test yeah. But your uh, it, this was to open the door for me. But then the art test was really proving that I can do um, the sub D modeling and texturing. It's also that if you go back, there is there is a Bungie art test helmet I did. Yeah. Uh, it's at the very bottom. Oh yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this one. That did it. Yeah. So, so what's important is to get the art test opportunity first. Right. Uh, how long did you spend on the art test? Uh, I've been working on this day and night for about a week and a half. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody always wonders, how long do I spend? Did they give you a time frame? No, they really didn't because they understand that we are working full time. Mm -hmm. So um, I only have a like six to seven hours maximum a day to work on the art test. Mm -hmm. uh, but I work all weekend um, just to get in as fast as I can. Um, so I think seven days, seven to 14 days was like a time frame mm -hmm. for them internally. Okay. Were you in constant contact with them or was it just like radio silence and then you turn it in? Um, it's, it was only for a week or two, so yep. there wasn't a chance to do like some feedbacking. Uh, but I know some other places you actually like turn in your high poly sculpt and let them give you feedback, and then they kind of see how you address that feedback, how you mm -hmm. receive feedback, and um, make changes and stuff. Yeah. But it was simple enough, so I didn't have to go through that whole back and forth. So this was their character art test. Mm -hmm. And was it for character art position or was it just for like a, you know, entry level? It was character art position. Uh, they had, um, so they give you choice. So you can pick an arm or the helmet mm -hmm. or the leg, I think. So um, whichever you choose, you don't have to do the helmet. Like you can choose uh, just do the arm, but I didn't want to do the arm because I didn't want to model fingers. Mm hmm. <laughs> and, that's awesome but one of my friends did, did the arm and it looked great um yeah i think most of the people just chose to do the helmet okay but do you, you they give you a I face thought, yeah i had to do the face i guess that's the main reason why people would want to do a helmet because of the face but it's a face versus fingers mm, i don't know so <laughs> <laughs> that's funny that's great um, so you've been doing this a while now. You're senior. What does it mean to be senior character artist? Um, senior character artist. I thought about that. Um, it really depends. It's different between studio to studio and person to person, yeah. right? So, um, one case you are at a studio long enough and you accumulate this valuable knowledge um, to become a senior. And, or you can be a super rookie that you're really talented and good and studio doesn't want you to uh, 
want to lose you to other studios, then they will promote you to senior. Uh, so it's a really case by case, I think. I've seen both, but the main theme will be, are you able to mentor other people? Are you able to kind of, um, you know, a guide, provide some kind of guidance to your peers and give um, proper feedback and stuff like that? Mm -hmm. That makes sense. So let's dial this back. You went in for product design. What made you decide games was it? How did that, how'd that spark? At first, I just wanted to do something 3D. So mm -hmm. I've been learning like Rhino and SolidWorks, all this old stuff, uh, jewelry design or things like that. Uh, but I, the main factor was that I didn't want to do something practical. Like I didn't want to worry about some real world problems where like a game, it's, you can make anything you can imagine, right? You don't have to worry about like material or how durable they are or like how people interact with the product. It, it's just like purely art. Mm -hmm. So I think the game, well, they, yeah, I think that's a kind of like fantasy, um, art fantasy you can realize in game art. That yeah. made me, yeah, shift from industrial design. Was there a moment where you were like, I'm definitely doing this? Because you had to commit. I mean, you had to go back to Korea. That must have been a little freaky. <laughs> I When I laid out some plan, well, in the beginning, you can just uh, have it all in your head. Mm -hmm. But you start laying out um, specific information. Like, I'm going to go to this place for school. I'm going to make, or make this tuition money doing that. Just planning things out. Just made me sure that this is the way to go mm -hmm. and i actually had like friends and cousins um working in gaming industry in korea yeah so i went there and just talking to them made me uh, you know um confident that i want to do this got it you could see the picture then yeah, you can kind of see your path. Uh, you can imagine your path, uh, imagine yourself walking through the path, um, step by step, setting smaller goals. So first thing, I'm gonna register for this school, and this is how I'm going to make money for it, and this is how I'm gonna stay there and make a living, and and in this time frame, let's say six months, I'm gonna have like two portfolio pieces. And then like by this time, I'm gonna come back. That kind of like future plan helps yeah. me to realize my dream, I think. Yeah, that makes sense. You know, just block, make it more achievable. Mm -hmm. uh, so what does a day look like for you? Like when you go in, um, do you have meetings? Do you have your own kind of project that you have to do? Um, how much autonomy do you have? Like just what does a normal day look like? I'm, I'm sure it's just a typical day. It's, I can't really um, say anything in detail because I'm under NDA. <laughs> okay. um, what I'm working on is secret. But yeah, it's just um, I walk into the office. Since it's very like Microsoft office yeah. culture, um, I have my own desk I go to. And uh, if there's meeting, then I will go to meeting and come back to my desk, get some coffee, and just um head down working with um uh, on my uh the the project i'm working on yeah i think it'll be the same for most of the artists yeah and then what about free time to do your own work yeah it's actually after work that i do most of the art stuff because mm -hmm. i'm always doing some kind of freelance personal work or recently i've been doing my uh some tutorial stuff or uh, getting materials for teaching online and things like that. Like I do more of the side stuff than the main job, the full-time job I do. Hmm. How do you get the freelance work? Like how does it just come to you from ArtStation or different places? No, I think you need to like, uh, find, go get, uh, get out there and just like send an email and poke your friends, see if there is freelance. Um, 
I got lucky with one of my friends. He was doing this freelance with Omnium Studio, mm-hmm. and I just kind of hook him. Hey, do you, do you know if they need more people? So uh, he he emailed Bobo and see if he, he would be interested to work with me. And he looked at my art station and said, "Yeah, um, we'll try out a project." So I did one project for him, and then he decided to give me more work. So that's mm-hmm. how I kind of built a relationship yeah. with all my studio. Um, other than that, sometimes you will get art station messages and things like that. But but freelance work, I think um, you need to go out there and ask around and like send an email and send the messages to get the work. Got it. Um, and are you just like, is it mostly friends or are you actually reaching out to studios? Um, for me, it was it was friends mostly. Because you have all this uh, free time, right? <laughs> free time, yeah, <laughs> after work time, <laughs> my life. <laughs> That's crazy. I think artists are like one of the only careers that they go and they work on the job and then they go home and they work on the job. Yeah. I mean, like, it's also a hobby. If you enjoy uh-huh. your job, it's, it's a better way to spend my time. So. Yeah, fair enough. I make money, so. Yeah. Where do you get um, inspiration? Uh, inspiration? I mean, you're looking, look, we're looking at this uh, mm-hmm. personal uh, personal work study here, right? Mm-hmm. And, um, so, are there artists that you kind of that that you just follow and that you know inspire you, or or how do you find these projects that you know you want to work on? Yeah, it's just too much inspiration these days. Like everywhere yeah. you go and look around, you get inspiring like movies or games like in our station like i can't even stay on our station for too long it's just like overwhelming um so i mean um it's just how i sort out my inspiration is more work than finding inspiration because you're honestly being inspired with your with your peers at job Okay. Because when I was at Bungie, like everyone was so talented, um, I somehow thought I need to, you know, work up to them, and um, that was a huge driver for me. Uh, and later on, like our station, looking at other people doing amazing stuff, um, really pushes me to uh, do more work in art myself. Mm-hmm. How do you sort through your inspiration? Because I totally agree with you. You know, it's, you're, we're here on your art station, but uh, sort through your inspiration. I mean, um, we're here on the art station. And it's like you know, it, it's an endless amount of stuff. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Like if you go to pics or trending ones, like you really need to like <laughs> uh, sort out what really comes to you, right? Mm-hmm. So. When my process is, uh, I look at the art and see, try to analyze it. What of it do I like? Yeah. Maybe it's design, lighting, or rendering. Um, it's more about when I'm picking concept art to make, right? Mm-hmm. And of course, I look at all those artists that I follow. Um, there's just an endless of them, and um, I kind of think in my head is this doable is this something i can make or is it going to look good in 3d Mm -hmm. Um, is this something i'm going to enjoy making that kind of um filtering helps me to narrow down what i want to uh, actually bring to personal work got it uh, so yeah when you start a project, how do you start? Do you start in ZBrush or block out in um, Maya or what's your process? So I used to do blocking out in um, Max. Okay. Just to lay down all the planes and um, block out models and then go to ZBrush to do high poly sculpting. 
but yeah. now I got more familiar with the uh, Z modeler brush. Yeah. I kind of start uh, in ZBrush with just cubes and cylinders and just do uh, crease modeling with the, uh, the dynamic subdivision thing. Mm -hmm. um, and then just, yeah, do everything in ZBrush. Yeah, this one I did in Max. This one I actually started from a pose, not from a T-pose model, I think. Mm -hmm. um, Sometimes it's kind of boring to start from T pose model. Yeah, <laughs> then, right. Uh, so I, I kind of posed it first, and then kind of put stuff on her. Uh, do you use Marvelous Designer, or how do you build the clothing? Um, this is a straight sculpting. This is kind of old work. Two years ago, I wasn't so yeah. familiar with Marvelous. Um, yeah. I, uh, I don't have license for a uh, marvelous designer, so I mm -hmm. don't know anything. No, but I I did a little bit when I was at Bungie because uh, they had a license. So I liked it, but I ended up re-sculpting it a lot. Yeah. Some of the folds doesn't make sense for the game character. And then later on, like I realized, maybe I can just do it faster in ZBrush and then just sculpt, uh, practice more in cloth sculpting. Mm -hmm. um, but I actually do uh, enjoy using Marvelous Designer. It's a future to-do list. Yeah. <laughs> you can always throw it on. Yeah. Uh, what kind I'll of stuff? Yeah. Hmm? You, you were going to say something? Oh, no, I say I will do it someday. Yeah. So what kind of software do you think people should be focused on as character artists today? Because, you know, this is a bit of a moving target. Um, I think it's fair to say substance designer is not like, you know, not an essential character artist um, software. Um, mm -hmm. But what should they be focused on? Um, there are just so many different ones. I know people are going crazy over Blender now. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I would stick to basic uh, foundation ones like mm -hmm. Maya or Max because that's the uh, software all the, the, the current production game studios use. And I ended up learning both Maya and Max um, because I had to. I initially only knew uh, Max, but without knowing Maya, I can't. I can't do. I can't work as a character artist. Yeah. So, I I I learned to do both. And ZBrush is, of course, everybody agrees. ZBrush is, uh, is a must. Yeah. Um. Um. Marmoset. The Marmoset toolbag. Mm -hmm. One important one. Substance um, painter. Yeah, painter, painter. Yeah, that's kind of obvious one. Right. Um. Yeah. So Maya Max, make mm -hmm. sure you make sure you're using one of the big boys. Mm -hmm. Um. I, you know, everybody is going Gaga over Blender right now, which is mm -hmm. great because at least there's a free option and there's no stigma. Because I remember when Blender used to have a stigma. Mm -hmm. Um. But it's gone now. Uh. ZBrush. Um, if I'm looking at this piece of yours, this is this thing that's on the screen right now. And uh, for those who are watching the video, um, we're looking at a hunter vest and uh, there's a bunch of complex pieces. Mm -hmm. And um, some of that's separated. Some of some of it looks like it's kind of a hard surface. Some of it's cloth, padded cloth. Um, when you start a process, project like this, uh, how, what is some of the what I want to get is I want to get a sense of the process for this because this is a this is a complex piece that you have built here. It's also got like um, ornamentation over it and mm -hmm. uh, and folded in complex ways. Uh, so uh, can you describe a bit of the process of building something as complex as this? Um. Yeah. Where should I begin? See. Um, for this one, I think I mainly did everything in ZBrush. Um, what? 
Yeah, yeah, I think, yeah, everything is from ZBrush. Um, if you uh, work in one of those studios, they have a base mesh, right? So you know yeah. where their like arm um, slide is going to be or where, where the neck is going to be and the wrist line so they can be mixed and matched with other pieces. Mm -hmm. So once you know those uh, boundaries, then you can kind of start filling um, the, the the main chest part. Mm -hmm. um, and then I just take low poly from existing uh, hunter test. They're yeah. like a super low poly, right? And then just like use it as base. Yeah. And um, uh, there are just so many pieces that I want to explain. Okay, for example, the, the main circular emblem that I have, I yeah. We just started um, with a cylinder in ZBrush and uh, just ad adding some edge loops and just like any other 3D applications. Mm -hmm. um, and then do the, the mask, masking with regular brush and then kind of clean it out with a pen and loop tool and um, those ropes. I think I did the the sorry I'm trying to remember how I did it. No, I appreciate uh, the the effort, and it's actually a surprise that it's a lot of it's in ZBrush, like um, the the uh, the stuff around the belt. Uh -huh. Is that all? Is that all ZBrush? Yeah, that's all ZBrush. Now I, I, I'll I'll be honest. I usually tell my students not to use ZBrush for this because people get into digital sculpting mindset and so then it's it's like it starts to look chunky and it looks like it's it looks like it's sculpted right uh but if you just stick to crease modeling in zebras without Perfect. increasing subdivision level yeah. and just maintain the cleanness yeah um it really helps me to uh, speed up the process because I don't have to worry about its individual vertices. Like I can just use my regular sculpting brushes to place them and modify them. Mm -hmm. And by crease uh, modeling, um, you're referring to, I got ZBrush open right here. Are you referring mm -hmm. to Z modeler or are you referring to um, when you come over here Hold on one sec, I'll draw on the screen. Um, you come over here and use crease and set a subdivision level and, and crease poly groups and things like that. Or are we talking about Z modeler? Uh, I use both. So once you get your basic shape with your Z modeler brush, yeah. then you can use crease, crease tools to um, do poly group creasing and okay. then do like a tolerance creasing that kind of gets you halfway. Mm -hmm. And then you uh, go in with a Z modeler brush, like edge, uh, edge tool, and just create individual uh, edge loops. Uh -huh. I love it. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's the basic of it. Okay, that makes total sense. I get it. And and it's actually you're using the new tool. Well, sorry, you're using the new and the super super old because crease modeling is like ZBrush too. Oh. So. Like, <laughs> yeah. We used to train on that back in the day, and people were like, "No, thank you. Uh, I think I'll stick to Maya." <laughs> I just like how you can kind of preview um, your model uh, with sculpted pieces and yeah. the modeled piece. Just having everything in one scene helps me a lot to visualize a final product yeah. because I'm constantly worried about the the overall shape, proportions, and yeah. balance. So it's important for me to have everything in one scene. So when I, when I sculpting the the cloth piece in the center, I can also look at other like pieces, low poly crease modeling pieces, and kind of adjust accordingly. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's just a constant adjusting takes a lot of time, and it's just faster if I do them all in one ZBrush. Bottom. Yeah, well, that's actually exactly the answer. One of the answers I was I was aiming for is because this level of complexity assembly is a massive pain in the ass. Mm -hmm. So yeah, if, you had, if you had to assemble all of this in Marmoset, like go through the and you know, it's like you can make so many problems before you even know it. Right, and then like believe it or not, all these little small parts they are they have their own like 
UV shells and material. It's just like mm -hmm. how Bungie like, pipeline is. Mm -hmm. I like to separate them out like piece by piece. For example, the straps, their own thing, own texture sets. It's just a really painful and a lot of work. <laughs> So you did this all, most of this in ZBrush. This is the high poly. This is not the low poly, correct? This is high poly. Okay. And then, so, top them. Yeah. Uh, and then, so then you build the low res over the top of this. When you're building the low res, you're actually building all of them, all of these pieces basically separate. You're not yeah. building it as a, a watertight, exactly. but no. it's all separate. Yeah, they're all separate. I mean, and, like, the underlying um, cloth piece or the base of it is yeah. one watertight uh mash but everything on top of it they are like all separate pieces man and this, so then they get their own separate uv shells and are we worried yeah. about draw calls at all or is that just that this all gets figured out by the tech heads at the end yeah it, i think it's the tech <laughs> they do their magic okay so and, this, this is really helpful so whenever um they get to be used for other ones they can just take that part without worrying about you know uvs and texture shell because they are all separate mm -hmm. so they can just take that tassel and just stick it somewhere else and it will be easy in one um, click thing okay that makes sense so it's much more modular that way yeah um when you're laying out the uvs let's say for you're laying out the uvs for the tassel are you laying them out entirely in a zero to one space or yeah, zero to one space. So it's but the texture it's going to be small, like a two fifty six. Okay, fair enough. All right, well, that makes sense. So then you could put a two fifty six next to another two fifty six that mm -hmm. fills a five twelve square, and then you know. Right. You know. Okay, um, but then now if we're talking about that shoulder, like the padded um, piece along the uh, the chest, mm -hmm. is is this all separate? Text separate UV zero to one and it's all fills that space all by itself too. Yep. Wow. Well, actually, since this is a long one, so I fill the half of the UV set. Yeah. So, uh, so the texture would be um, what two fifty six by five twenty uh, five twelve. So that. Okay. Yeah. Oh. All right. Um. So it's squashed all into the zero to one, but then just a longer texture. Mm -hmm. um, awesome. I get that. Uh, okay. And then how much of this gets normal mapped? Um, it doesn't look like there's enormous complexity. I mean, like, um, uh, but if I'm looking here at the, here, I'll, I'll draw on the screen and uh, I'll describe. So if we're looking at this kind of belt piece in here, these are all, this is all geometry, these little circular pieces next to these, this all becomes geometry, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh, well, I, in this mat, uh, in this case, I kind of baked everything as one shell. Okay. So if you scroll down and look at the in-game shot, you can kind of tell they are being stretched and, um, right so this whole uh, abdominal piece is one oh wait never mind so sorry okay i now i realize the circular things there are yeah they're one uh one modular piece so you can i kind of copied it six times to okay place it. yeah but then the underlining piece is basically one yeah that's um, all big thing yeah yeah and you got some geometry down at the edge to get that silhouette right okay i understand that that looks cool. Um, now, in games today, I know you can't talk too much about pipelines and stuff like that, and, and I get that. Um, but do you have a sense? Because one of the big questions people have is like, you know, how many polys do I make a model? Um, how many textures? Um, you know, and my answer to people is always, you know, first you got to make it look good before they mm -hmm. even bother asking those questions. Like, how many mm -hmm. polys is your model? First, it's got to look, you know, sexy. But in in your perspective, like, you know with today's workflow in modern games, what are we looking at in terms of polygon count, the amount of textures, the number of texture sets, you know, like if you can just give us some guidance, that'd be great. Uh, like production level uh, yeah. for games? Yeah. So I think it's really um, different if you're doing campaign, like unique characters, or right. if you're doing like armor characters, right? Okay. For me, like I, uh, I'm kind of specialized in armor, uh -huh. um, production 
So they need to, so um, the thing is they're going to be multiple players wearing the same thing. So can, they cannot be um, over a certain level. So it doesn't um, uh, make the game chug, mm -hmm. right? So uh, say for this, for the Warlock test, um, I think that has most to polygon budget. So if you look at the, the one, two, the fifth one, that's the World Warlock test. I, the one with the, the ropes and blue straps. Ropes and blue straps, sorry. Uh, not like this fifth one. one. Fifth one on top. Oh, fifth one on top. Yeah. This one. Yeah. That one was, I think, um, around 12,000. Tries. Wow. Yeah, that's great. I mean, that's mm -hmm. very low risk. Yeah, it's it's a low risk because it's for multiplayer. Yeah. Awesome. But I'm sure if you get to me, you get campaign characters, like unique characters, you can go way over. Um, but for multiplayer, so we're kind of um, restricted. Here we to, go. Yeah. So this is the 12,000. This, what we were looking at earlier is the high poly. Right, that's a high poly a key shot render. Great. And here we and then, go. Like, yeah, they're the twelve thousand. Beautiful. Okay, so when you're coming in and you're doing Ray, you got an environment to stay focused on. Ray's like, this is inspiring me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we had Alejandro in here for a second, and I should tell you what Alejandro said. He said Rosa is so so humble and says she gets lucky. Alejandro um, was at ArenaNet when you were at ArenaNet. Oh, is, is this uh, my friend Alejandro? Yeah, I think that was my friend Alejandro. He's, he's in the I, network, actually. I've talked to Alejandro a couple of times. He is, he is a wonderful soul. Great guy. Um, and he's helped several students here. Oh, um, I see. Hello. Uh, I think he popped out. Um, <laughs> Thomas, the, all this technical info is loosening. Good, I'm glad, Thomas. Um, what about, and we should probably talk about this. What about UDIMs? I know, I know I'm having this like super technical conversation with you and I hope it's okay. Um, but you're very clear in how you're delivering this and talking about it. So it's great. Um, uh, what about UDIMs? I didn't deal with UDIMs um, in Pat Studios that much yet. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I don't have much to say about UDIMs. That says it all right there. Yeah. You know. That's what's important. And, and um, how much – can you talk about the technical artist and the character artist? Um, because it, this is a bit of a moving target how much somebody should be mindful of the technical and how much we should be mindful of the aesthetic. Because, the, you know, the aesthetic is hard. It's hard to understand how the sculpt – like this, if I'm looking at your warlock, the padded uh, um, uh, forearm protectors, like getting that to look good. It's just hard in a sculpt. Mm -hmm. How do you interact with technical artists? Like, can you describe that that relationship a little bit? Yeah, uh, we did a lot of back and forth um, from concepting stage. Uh, okay. So I think this one's yeah, concepted by Susan. So she will have us over to her desk. So me and a tech technical artist. And just look at over the, the concept and we point out uh, which part is concerning. For example, mm -hmm. uh, we had a problem with the cloth. We could not have too much going on for the costing part. So there's like a tassel pieces on the, uh, on the side they used to like a cross and do make more interesting shape. Yeah. Uh, but we had to like tell her, oh, it's not doable. It's most of the time we tell content artists, hey, it's hard to make, you can do that. It's, yeah, it's not fun. Because we have to, yeah. I can't find her art station. I, no, I don't think she has an art station. Um, She's not into that kind of social media, I think, but she's an amazing artist. I love her. Uh, anyways, so <laughs> it's most of the time we ask tech artists, can we do this? And and they say no, uh, but uh, we kind of do this discussion. Maybe we can, maybe we cannot make them cross, but we can make them shorter so they go on the sides so they don't like um, collide with the thighs as much. Mm -hmm. um, that kind of discussion is always like, 
it's daily interaction thing we do but sometimes we don't catch from the concept stage right we just mm -hmm. keep making and making it and later we realize oh hey this is causing this kind of problem then right. we have to like do another conversation over it and how do we maintain this as, uh, art uh, as much as possible but at the same time make them work most of the time it's the shifting things around mm -hmm. and tech artists are usually generous and they want to like help us make things look good mm -hmm. so it's just a really collaborative um uh, effort um yeah but yeah that's pretty much it they i they're really passionate to make art look good but we kind of have to accept the technical limitation that we yeah. can do certain things yeah. yeah yeah that makes sense so they're keeping the frame rate um and various other memory management stuff mm -hmm. um, if we're looking at the back of this uh is this actual geometry or do you use a card for this because i'm seeing the that, shadow that's a card actually it's a floating little bit so that's catching the shadow a little bit uh -huh. it's outside out um but the side ones are solid uh, mesh but i had to raise it to that level so it doesn't um interfere with the cloth simulation below mm -hmm. usually um well, it used to come down way lower, but uh, the rope part, the skirt part, it's a flat card, and we can't use the, uh, any polygons for right. cloth and pieces. So we had to kind of raise it and then just make it more clumpy. So it did. It ended up receiving less of simulation part because you can kind of tell from the left image where the the cloth is being um, bent. That's yeah. where the, the costume starts. So okay. everything above it will be uh, soft skin to the legs and body. Okay. And then everything below is being cloth simulated. Ah, got it. Okay. And you can see it right in that bump right there. Right, right. That's what's causing that, uh, okay. that stretching. And when it's in motion, that's a different. Right. It gets handled differently or you see it differently. Okay, cool. So thank you. I really appreciate you kind of diving in. I know I asked a, a lot of mm -hmm. um, tech kind of stuff, so that was really nice for you to to go in. I think um, if I'm looking at that uh, that hunter vest of yours, like I know f from my students, like this is a this is a goal is to create something that has this level of complexity. Mm -hmm. um, so that's really great. Uh, so why don't we do this, guys? Uh, let's get some questions. I've got a few of the people uh, that are here with me live. Um, they're usually my boot camp students or the hardcore ones that are here. Um, and then do you have a second to look at a couple of students' work? Oh, yeah, 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 of course. Okay, cool. Makes sense to me, Rosa. Thank you. Yeah. Um, do you have any advice that you give students regularly? Let's say somebody comes to you and they're like, I want to be lucky like you are lucky. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think oh. you're lucky. I think you're incredibly talented, but let's just say they come and nah. they say, I'm lucky like you. What do you, what do you say? So, um, I, well, I get messages time to time mm -hmm. from people who are really frustrated with like current market. Like it's hard mm -hmm. to find a job. Yep. Just getting the door is hard. And I honestly really think it's the timing and most of the part is luck. Mm -hmm. uh, it's is if you don't get a job, it mean it doesn't mean your art isn't good enough. Yeah. It's just that you're uh, looking at wrong um, at the wrong company, wrong time. Um, but like you just have to keep up, keep up your keep up with your work and try to do a job and update your portfolio. So when the time comes, so you're ready to go into that in interview and ace that art test yeah. and get the job, right? So you just be prepared always because um, you never know when the time is going to come. Um, I got lucky myself. I just got the timing early on my stage. But if you just keep working, um, just don't feel discouraged and think you're not good enough and try to find out what the problem is with your work. Um, just think you're good enough and just you need to find the right company that's good fit for you. Mm, that's great. So don't just apply at one place. 
Cause... No, no. <laughs> It'd be bad strategy. Yeah, apply all over. Mm -hmm. All right, Rosa, thank you. And thank you guys for joining me here um, live. I know it's a little later than we normally do these things. Um, oh, yeah, so... sorry about that. I, I just had to come from work. Oh, please. You're, you, you just spent an hour with us mm -hmm. and uh, shared your knowledge. Thank you. Uh, I, uh, I would do that anytime. All right, it's my pleasure. All right, take care. Thanks, guys. All right, thank you. Okay, see ya. All right. So I want to thank you so much for being here, for taking the time, and for listening to this podcast. And I want to ask a couple of things from you. Number one, make sure you leave a comment or you rate this on iTunes, Stitcher, wherever it is that you're getting this. That's going to make a big difference in helping us get the word out and get people to know who we are. All right. The other thing is I want to make sure you know where to find us. So you can head over to www.gameartinstitute.com where you can learn about our flagship program, which is the Game Artist Boot Camp. This, this is designed for those who are really looking to move the needle on their career and really lock in that job. You may have gone to school and learned a bunch, maybe haven't learned a bunch. But at the Game Art Institute, the primary focus we have is the very specific industry skills, the triggers that you really need to hit in that job interview. What are the specific things that they're looking for? That's what we're going to be training you on. We're taking applications right now for environment artists and for character artists. So make sure you head over to www.gameartinstitute.com and apply today. That way we can have that conversation, make sure this is a fit for you, make sure that you're a fit for it. And if everything is perfect, then we will sign you up for that right away and get you into your training and start moving the needle on your career. All right. Thank you so much again for being here. Take care. Have an amazing day.